now that we're at um, 1131, I think we'll kick it off and hopefully Abby, uh, Abby will be on with us as soon as possible. Um, I couldn't be more, welcome everybody. I couldn't be more thrilled to be welcoming, welcoming Andrea Levere to YPC 2021. Uh, Andrea Levere is the president emerita of Prosperity Now, where she spent 27 years building an organization to ensure everyone can gain financial stability and achieve prosperity. She also serves as the executive fellow at the International Center for Finance here at the School of Management, where she has been leading research being discussed here today. And most important to me is that she's been a godsend to the Yale Philanthropy Conference team for all the guidance and support she has provided to us and all of those who have come before us um, in planning YPC. As many of, of you know, Yale SOM's mission is to educate leaders for business and society. And for many students at SOM, Andrea's career and leadership epitomizes that of a Yale SOM alum, as exemplified by her work and research on equitable finance and the necessity of creating an asset class that better supports the financial strength and resilience of the social sector, while also addressing the need for investment in organizations led by or serving communities of color. Thank you, Andrea. We couldn't be more grateful. Um, and with that, I'll hand it off. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Elena. And I first want to congratulate you and the mighty, mighty crew of students who organized this year's Yale Philanthropy Conference. Um, I hope everybody knows that there has been a president, precedent setting enrollment of over 1,200 people so far. And we hope all of you are here with us today. Um, and quite an extraordinary event done in our virtual room. Um, and I also want to thank all the panelists we have with us today uh, to have a conversation that, to me, <clears throat> is really going to frame how we reimagine philanthropy. Um, one of the things Elena did not say is that this is the only philanthropy conference hosted by a business school. And to me, that is exactly why I am here today. Um, so let me just start taking you a little bit back to where the whole idea of enterprise capital came from, which was really the vision of a woman named Clara Miller, who founded the Nonprofit Finance Fund and then came uh, to lead the Heron Foundation. And she really did the deepest analysis of what is nonprofit finance? And why do we pigeonhole it in a way we don't think about for-profit finance? And really raised the ideal that nonprofit enterprises should have the same kind of equity capital that for-profit enterprises do to really build them with financial strength and resilience. It is that legacy that I really focused on after, as we heard, 27 years of working at Prosperity Now with 15 leading it and constantly coming up against philanthropy, providing funding and capital on terms that violated many of the principles I learned in my finance classes at SOM. And I was very lucky having a deep finance background and an extraordinary CFO that I was in a position to understand this, restructure it, figure out what the financial models are. But I constantly had conversations and worked with my colleagues and others who didn't have those benefits, who came at their work from a passion for the issue, not caring at all about finance. So when I had the opportunity to work as an executive fellow with Will's invitation, I decided that this was the issue I really wanted to focus on. And then, as we all know, we started this research and then COVID hit, and then George Floyd hit, and then the economic issues hit. And suddenly we saw a movement within philanthropy with the call for action to raise up principles that really are at the core of the kind of enterprise, flexible, long-term capital that we had been advocating for, which really has created a window for us to think about why this matters and where can we go to really scale it. So the end result of this fellowship 
was uh, writing, which is on the website at the Yale Philanthropy Conference, the blueprint for enterprise capital. Everybody on this screen, as will Abby Suarez when she gets here, was critical in helping to create this, as was five research assistants um, who were second year uh, Yale MBAs and one first year, now a second year, who are so valuable to the document that they're credited as co-authors, you'll hear from them later, um, to really produce this blueprint. Um, each panelist had a critical role, and you'll hear from all of them. Will Getzman, who runs the International Center for Finance, hosted this work, helped with convenings, research, and analysis. Logan Herring, who, who leads WRK Enterprises, is one of the case studies in the blueprint. We have four case studies and the CEOs of all the organizations should be online, which really demonstrates why enterprise capital matters and what happens when you don't have it. Ashish Advani, who is a serial entrepreneur and leading one of the most impactful international companies, uh, JA Worldwide, is gonna bring the perspective both domestic and international of what it means to bring this capital there. And Abby Suarez, who was my program officer at JP Morgan Chase, but worked in the nonprofit sector most of her career, can really speak to how philanthropy thinks about this and where we need to go to really take this practice and scale it. So we are gonna focus on two big questions, which is really from each of our perspectives, describing why enterprise capital matters, and then speaking about how we take this kind of philanthropic and social investing to scale at a time when we've never needed it more. So I'd like to start with Will to share his thoughts on why this matters. Yes, thank you, Andrea. And I should say just a little bit more about Andrea's uh, uh, executive in residence, if you will, uh, at the Yale School of Management. Uh, we have a, a finance center, but as many of you know that know something about the School of Management, our mission really is focused on business for the benefit of society. And finance is a tool that you can use um, for great good as well as um, as other things. So in, in our finance center, we're very interested in the use of financial tools and financial uh, analytics um, to, um, to make the world a better place, quite simply. Um, I'll, I'll just, you know, give a little bit more about that. I mean, my personal interest as a finance professor um, extends to this fundamental question of wealth inequality that is um, is so acute right now, uh, particularly during COVID, but just in the last uh, two or three decades, it has uh, been accentuated. And um, we've been thinking at the center about how we might use investment in equity um, as a method for helping families with, with no wealth or very little wealth um, to build in a way that is much more than just uh, one generation, but something that could be sustained for a long time. Now that could never happen without some form of involvement with, uh, by philanthropy. And I'm thinking about the kinds of organizations that many of you are involved with that, that think about how to, um, uh, how to make things that don't exist yet uh, happen how to experiment, how to demonstrate feasibility in ways that for-profit organizations might not take those chances. So I'm really pleased to be part of this. I have a lot more of a kind of enthusiastic um, things to say about uh, the, um, the Clara Miller concept of the fundamental need for equity, uh, capital in not-for-profits, but I think my colleagues on this panel actually have lived that as opposed to my studying it. So I'm looking forward to what they have to say. Well, all I have to say, it's the marriage of all these perspectives that have given this the power that we so need. So with that, Logan, I'd love you to share a little bit of your story of how enterprise capital and funders 
who believed in it help to transform a community? Yeah, thank you, Andrea, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. I'm honored to be here. Uh, a little bit about you know my story and uh, my history with enterprise capital and how to how it has really uh, given us the ability to leverage that enterprise capital and then build upon it to something that is is great to be a part of right now. Um, in 2016, I started to work at a community center where I was brought in to save uh, this you know failing organization. Um, it's a community center that's in the most impoverished neighborhood in the city of Wilmington, where 70% of our children live in poverty. And the community center was about to close its doors. It had missed payroll. Um, when I got there, we were on a 13-week rolling cash flow for about two years. But we had one particular funder that stood by us through the, the test of times and continued to fund us. Um, he believed in, in my leadership. He believed in the board that, in the staff that we had brought to the table. Uh, and this started because at the age of 23, I started my own nonprofit. And he was one of my first funders. So that relationship had been there over time. And I, actually, I, I make fun of him all the time. He was one of the individuals, if not the individual, that coerced me to, to come over and join the board of this community center. And then within three months, I was executive director all of a sudden. Uh, but, you know, a failing organization that had a less than $2 million budget that then, after we stabilized it after two years, really laid the foundation for these other two organizations that I am now running, Reach Riverside, which is a community development corporation that operates under the purpose-built communities model. Shout out to all my purpose-built colleagues that are watching. And then the warehouse, which is a state-of-the-art teen center. So we have now pulled together three organizations working collaboratively. That's why we call ourselves the work group. We are up to 130 employees, up to almost a $9 million operating budget and managing $14 million in assets. And more importantly, coordinating a $250 million holistic revitalization of this impoverished neighborhood, which we have mixed income community with 600 units of housing and a $30 million new Kingswood Community Center that we will we'll be building soon. So um, it's amazing what can be done when you have just a little bit of faith and investment. And uh, you definitely, like I said, you wanna get on this train as it's pulling out of the tracks. You don't wanna get on it when it's full speed. And we're so thankful that we had people that invested in the beginning and now can see what uh, can happen when you do something like that. And I do wanna share that Logan, one of your funders had come out of private investing, right? So kind of understood this framework, which as I think part of the lessons we want to bring, which is this is why it works so well. I also want to share that Logan is part of a national initiative uh, that Prosperity Now runs called Building High Impact Nonprofits of Color, which is also about how do we change the inequities in both how capital is distributed and how organizations are built. Um, and I think that one of the things that we've discovered in the work on enterprise capital today is why the idea for this really came out very similar to venture capitalists of how do we take a startup and grow? Right now, we've, we're looking at this capital of how do we stabilize organizations so they can serve the communities they need to serve so well? And then how do we think about growing parts of it that are necessary for these times? And I think it's that creativity with this kind of capital that's also so valuable. So with that, let's move to Ashish, who's gonna give us a broad international perspective on how this kind of capital and philanthropy works. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, and I see from the chat and from the people list that we do have quite a few people who actually have roles with global organizations, international organizations. So. Um, I want to start by saying that, um, you know, junior achievement is structured as a network of teams. So really we have teams of, of people of say five to 50 people spread over 115 countries around the world. So because we're structured as a network of teams, the way we think about enterprise capital is informed by that. And I will just say, you know, like every organization, uh, we struggle to find ways to engage donors and build the trust it takes to uh, migrate from purely restricted grants to unrestricted grants. 
And much of at least my role, and I've learned so much from you, Andrea, having been involved with Prosperity Now on the board for several years, you know, how that trust is built and how you have to really be patient to be able to sort of segment your donors based upon what their interests are. So the trust comes that they actually want to support your mission in an unrestricted way as opposed to a restricted way. And one way we've done that at JA is by inviting donors to serve on our boards. Um, and we've done that really at scale, which is why I wanted to share that example, because it might be helpful as we think about how to scale uh, enterprise capital and impact um, e across geographies and even across um, within the US at, uh, domestically. So we have over 6,000 board members across the JA network which I know is this, it might be a scary concept to think of that many board members, but I think it's that which has allowed us to build the trust to migrate what would typically be um, a relationship uh, which would be based completely on restricted grants to ones where there's enough um, sort of a voice of the donor to ensure that our programs have the accountability that they're expecting. And I think that's really helped JA over time now We've grown, um, we, over the last five years, we've uh, raised and deployed over $1.5 billion around the world, just to give you a sense of the scale. And when you think of what we actually do on the ground and why this is really relevant, I mean, imagine, for example, impacting a, a, a young girl or a young boy in Kenya or in the Middle East, and it's their first experience with entrepreneurship. So we could either get a restricted grant to run an entrepreneurship program exactly in the way the donor might think it should be run and debate over sort of how we give them credit for that grant, or we could have them be on a board, create an unrestricted grant, which allows us to build enough enterprise capital to actually have offices on the ground in these 115 countries and actually allow that donor, for example, to still get credit for the great uh, philanthropy that they provided um, but that can come in the form of an unrestricted grant, not a restricted grant. So if you can bifurcate the search and, and, and need for credit for each segment of donor from the accounting of restricted versus unrestricted, it truly unleashes the possibility of um, sort of using accounting for good as opposed to making it restrictive to our success. So I hope that's a helpful example. And uh, I've got a few more I can give you, but I'll just pause there. Um, and before I let you off the hook, Ashish, there's a question here that I thought would be great to hit. Does having funders on the board restrict or cause conflict with an organization's autonomy? I'll answer that. And it just says you pick the right ones. But Ashish, you go. <laughs> yeah, I think this is really a central point, to be honest, is, um, you know, if you think of the role of a board and you think of the role of a donor and you really think systematically about how to maximize impact, if it's a fight for influence and control, you'll never win. If it's a fight for agreeing on what the best form of impact is and actually listening to all voices around the table, then it's a completely different conversation. And especially in a global organization, it's, it's ludicrous to think that a donor based in Boston knows what's best for a young girl in Saudi Arabia or Yemen or Bahrain. But if we have a board of 30 people who are all willing to hear each other's voices, and you can make that happen at scale, it's, a, it, 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 it's not a battle for then control and influence, but it's a battle for understanding who, who knows how to maximize impact. Uh, I do think it's a challenge if you have a five-person board and one of them is a donor, that I think might be a challenge. But with a 30-person board where five of them are donors or 10 of them are donors, it's a different balance. And we've got a lot of 30-person boards around our network, which is why the numbers are, are, are so big in terms of board members. Thank you, Ashish. And I got a wonderful question. What is enterprise capital? Um, so before we go further, um, of course, you've got to read the blueprint. But let me just start, and then that's a perfect segue to Abby, who thankfully is here with us to talk about her uh, commitment and interest which basically it is um, funding, largely a grant, but not always, that funds the entire organization, not a specific program, not a specific issue. And it funds it usually on a longer term basis and it's tied very clearly to the strategy of the organization. And our recommendation is that there are outcome impact metrics that are designed in a sharing way between the funders and the organizations. 
And then one of the innovations that actually came out of the work with J.P. Morgan Chase is that, back to my point earlier, that most people don't go into the nonprofit sector because they love finance. They go in because they love what they're doing and the passion that they have is how do you create a enterprise capital cabinet that brings together some of the key core competencies and expertise that you need to use the capital in a way that's going to get you where you want and where that funder wants you to be. So I hope, Harold, that was a good enough uh, uh, definition. And now, Abby, uh, please share kind of your perspective on this and why enterprise capital matters. We can't hear you, Abby. Okay, one second. And I'll just say to Tara's point, that's exactly what uh, Mackenzie Scott's doing. Are you with us now? Not yet, okay. Can you talk now? All right, so with that, uh, we will wait in great expectation for Abby's insights, which will be fabulous. Um, but let's move on with the panel with really our next big uh, question, which is how would you scale both the delivery of enterprise capital and the capacity to use it? Can't hear you yet. I have great faith in our IT crews. Um, Who'd like to take that first? So I'll, I'll jump in. And the question, Great. just to clarify, how, how would you uh, scale it? Yeah. How, how should we grow this? Um, and everybody come from their perspective. As a practitioner who is part of vibrant networks, how do we think about raising up this practice? Well, well first of all, we have to figure out what works. And I love the fact that we're talking about uh, the folks that have the passion, but also the folks that have the capability um, to make sure that things are done with fidelity. And I just look at from, you know, from simply from my perspective, um, everyone would agree that I, I have a passion for this work and, and I love doing what I do. And I'm doing it from the, for a community where I'm from. Uh, but I understand as a, you know, a high school coach and former athlete, that I have to have certain team members around me to really, really have a successful team and to win that ultimate prize, that championship or that goal. And um, I think the team that, you know, we have been able to pull together um, to attract and retain really allows us um, to have the greatest impact that we possibly could have. You know, I think of my right and my left hand, uh, Kenyatta and Dave, my chief financial strategist and my, my COO. And I think of all of the team members that we brought to the table. Uh, but that is very intentional, and we operate similar to a for-profit company, where when we're talking about, you know, attraction and, and retention, we have to talk about how we make them feel valued. And one thing that uh, allows us to do that is compensating them, you know, value-based compensation, where because if any of these um, individuals were to leave, they would be able to go out onto the market um, in whatever sector they want to be able to demand top dollar. And we believe that wholeheartedly. And it's not just, you know, from a, a monetary perspective, it's what's the culture that we're creating around them. Um, on Mondays, we instituted something about four months ago, Mental Health Mondays, where you're not even allowed to work, you know, for half the day. Um, you have to do something health related, going to a walk, work out, sleeping in. Um, and the other four hours a day, you're not allowed to have meetings. Focus on strategy for the rest of the week and plan out your week. So you don't have that Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening anxiety. We all suffer, particularly in this pandemic from vicarious trauma. And our team is on the front lines working with the community. And we understand that that takes a heavy toll on one's mental health. So what are we doing? You know, compensation, environment, support, um, all of those things that you, know, you wanna get up and work the next day, where you feel inspired and you feel energized, you feel like you recharge your battery. Those are the things that we've been able to do from our perspective. Now you've created that culture where you're, you're hitting on all cues 
all cylinders, and then you say, all right, this is what we did. And how can we help others do the same thing? Because, you know, as they say, as the tide rises, all boats rise. And, and we truly believe that. Um, in working with purpose-built communities, we understand that there are over 800 communities in similar situations as Riverside. All of those communities are our communities. And if the pandemic, if all of the, the social and racial injustice that we've seen over the last year haven't taught us anything, is that we have more similarities than we have differences. And we all want the same basic needs for ourselves and our families. So why shouldn't we work together to achieve that? Oh, thank you, Logan. And it all speaks to what is the capital infrastructure that you need to be able to build those operating systems and that investment strategy. So Will, nobody is more expert in how capital markets have evolved for the last four centuries than you. So how do we think about using the structures that has made capital markets thrive as we rebuild the capital markets that serve the nonprofit sector? Uh, I was really excited uh, as I heard Logan talking about um, his perspective and in some ways how different my perspective might be. And I think you've touched on this. Um, I'm kind of excited right now about the new fintech technology that might help us amass much greater pools of capital and put them to the purposes that uh, we've been talking about. Not, um, not picking and choosing selected projects and being the marginal, uh, marginal contributor, but, but support of organizations that have a mission. Um, and, um, you know, uh, we have right now, I think, if you like in the last decade or so, a lot of people who are savers and investors also have a desire to be purposeful about what those investments are up to. Um, and of course, the term ESG uh, in the investment world is just on, um, it's, it's front and center on, on many of the um, uh, decisions that are being made, um, both at the individual level, like, you know, what mutual funds do I want to invest in, but also uh, at the level of large scale financial organizations addressing concerns that bubble up from people's desire for purposeful um, investing. So. Um, I think that you put those two things together, the FinTech, which is the technology to be able to connect people to mission oriented organizations with the understanding that um, there, there are, uh, they're taking risks on particular missions, but they want to, uh, and organizations that, um, that, that have, um, have purpose, but they've in some sense been mostly supported by either large um, uh, uh, corporate or or or, or foundation uh, contributors, and and also of course um, uh, individuals and families that want to see these things happen. I think that there will be some very useful disintermediation if we can um, begin to grow the technology that allows people to feel part of an organization. Um, and a connected, continuous part of an organization that has a purpose that meets that meets their um, their own personal sense of themselves and how they would like um, you know to see problems like the, our, uh, our our income inequality problems, for example, solved. So um, I think it's going to be fintech that's going to help us a little bit uh, in this. And we clearly need to make sure that we regulate that in the right way, right, Will? <laughs> so, um, terrific. Abby, can we hear you now? Okay, uh, the great IT team will still work on it. So, Ashish, how do we think about scaling this? Well, I think there's solutions for both strategy and structure to create scale. So I completely applaud what Logan's doing um, on the strategy side, right? I think engaging the people of the organization and ensuring you've got the right talent and ensuring that the people who work for nonprofits are compensated well is such a critical example of a good strategy. And I think Will as well gave an example of how FinTech can sort of unleash a new both source and motivation for giving at scale using technology. And FinTech, as you know, has been applied in so many industries already to sort of change the capital markets. I don't think it's actually reached the point 
for nonprofits, to Will's point, that it's making a significant difference in the way most nonprofits are run. I think that it's, it's going to be a journey to get there. And I, I hope it goes faster. I've actually I've been involved in two or three initiatives to actually make it go faster. Um, but it takes time. It takes time for behavior change and fintech to work together. On the structure side, um, I, I've already mentioned the network structure that JA has, which has enabled some amount of scale for enterprise capital globally. I want to highlight that networks, alliances, and coalitions are existing structures that enable nonprofits with a shared mission to come together with um, a way to pool resources to create you know, enterprise capital at the right levels of the organization to make the investments needed. Whether the investments are for technology, whether the investments are for ensuring the highest quality programs. Um, the idea of shared services around alliances, networks, and coalitions, I think is, I, I think people sometimes are scared of it because of the loss of control. And I, I wanna keep coming back to this because so much of this is ensuring that you actually are willing to hear other voices in the way you think about maximizing impact. Prosperity Now has done such a good job of building the Prosperity Now community, for example, which allows other voices to be heard and that allows, frankly, impact to be maximized as long as there's some degree of a shared sense of purpose. And that's, I think, what leadership in the future is going to be about in nonprofits is leadership by influence, not leadership by edict. And mm. um, so that, that, I guess my observation for how to maximize impact. And can I piggyback on that really quickly? Me too. Absolutely. So, so she mentioned something that we practice here is shared services. So I oversee three separate nonprofits, but we work collectively together. And we have a shared services agreement between the three organizations. Reach Riverside serves as the management organization. And then we have two community serving organizations that have their own facilities as well. They're the, the services, the boots on the ground and Reach serves as the management. And the three organizations um, have a formal shared services agreement that they split the expense of the operating calls of Reach Riverside, which really allows us to get the full benefit of all of the employees we have. But you have to give up a little bit and there has to be some compromise from everyone. And I have three boards to answer to, but we've been able to make it work because we understand that the community is the greatest thing we have to serve. Not our boards, not our staff, it's the community. And if we put the community first, we really can have the greatest impact when we put our own egos to the side and say, we really wanna drive impact in the community. And what's the best way to do that? Share these services, share these resources and bring the best talent to make it happen. One of the um, big issues that emerged as part of the work we did, and we held multiple focus groups and other things, is this tyranny of specialness, right? That we see afflicts the nonprofit sector, the philanthropic sector, that we all have to be special. And I think what we are underscoring is that there's a way to have a unique vision and mission, but at the same time, there's so much about running these organizations that's not special at all. As we know right now, not being able to get Abby on this screen. So, um, Abby, can we hear you yet? Nope, okay. So we're, we're gonna keep going on this. Um, but I do think that that issue is really an incredibly important piece. So one of the issues that Abby was gonna raise, and I really wanna uh, uh, bring that back to you. Abby, you there? Can we hear you? Um, is, how we operate in a time with multiple crises and how you see the role of this capital in being able to equip organizations uniquely in this time. Because one thing we have to do, and I have a great point here about how most donors are risk averse. And we hear this time and time again. What would happen if the CEO just ran away with my money and got a Cadillac? which is exactly why they're in the nonprofit sector, I'm sure. But um, how do we help manage? And I think Ashish's point about his board and how he's managed that board is a great piece. But I also think it has to do with a network of shared learning and shared investment. So nobody feels like they're taking that much of a risk. So I'd love each of you just to comment as we think about 
COVID recovery, as we think about racial equity, and as we think about the very long-term economic issues being faced nationally, but particularly in communities of color, how we mobilize this kind of capital for today. A small question. Uh, I'm happy to take a, a shot because that question is such an interesting question. You know, the idea of risk aversion in this uh, circumstance, yes. it's funny because once you've given your money, it's gone. You're not getting a return back. You're not, you're not getting an equity return in money back. So the, the risk aversion is really about whether or not the, the, the uh, expectation about achievement that the, or, uh, the, the organization's achievement will be fulfilled, and then how do you measure it? So I think, um, you know, I know that um, philanthropy for the, for the last couple of decades has focused increasingly on metrics that can be reported. I, you know, that's, that's sort of one way of addressing this, which is information of the sort that people um, w w want to um, receive in order to make them feel like their dollars have have uh, have done some good. But um, you know, I'm I'm also look as a professor. I'm interested when you identify an in a peculiar behavioral phenomenon, like like uh, Scott has done with respect to risk aversion. What are you afraid of? Kind of questions. And um, that often has to do with a peculiar heuristic about um, about treating um, tr treating negative things much more severely in your emotion than treating the positive things, and <clears throat> and the ways that um, people do that. Uh, one way to do it is is through more complete information and examples of things that, that are good that have happened. Another way to do it is to uh, moderate um, the um, the affect and the emotion around uh, around um, the the phenomenon, but uh, I think behavioral economics is a nice is a great field uh, to potentially um, explore just this question that Scott's brought up. And I have to say, at Prosperity Now, um, in our work on uh, children's savings and match savings for adults. We did extensive pilots around uh, behavioral psychology and economics. And one of the things that I'll never forget, one of our consultants saying is, people hate losing more than they like winning. Mm -hmm. And that to me was just a very powerful way to understand how do you address that fear from the get-go and what are the mechanisms that you can use? And I think this is very relevant as many of our folks here have raised in terms of how we go forward. Um, Ashish. Uh, so I think you're right. I think Will's absolutely right that behavioral economics has a, a lot to teach us here. Um, people do uh, hate losing more than they like winning, but even more than they like, so even more than that, they like innovating. So by being able to create a structure around innovation where it's okay to lose 80% of the time as long as you succeed 20% of the time, you know, the venture capital industry has done such a good job of partnering with dynamic young entrepreneurs and sometimes social entrepreneurs to create impact at scale with a high amount of trust, with a board seat, with influence, but yet everyone gets along and creates massive impact. That sort of principle where at, at Jay, for example, we created JA Labs. We worked with the City Foundation to create JA Labs, where it was absolutely okay to try things that were gonna fail. Now we've created a center for learning innovation that's focused specifically on inclusion. And it's gonna be okay to try things in a global network where sometimes things work and sometimes things don't work. And setting those expectations around, particularly around inclusion, where there's gonna be attempts that may scale quickly and some that may take six iterations before they work. As long as you manage expectations, I, I personally am very confident that, that funders will um, want to see more of that. And if most of us are solving problems that nobody has solved before, right, that the market has not found a solution to, in many cases, the only way we learn is by failing. And that isn't necessarily uh, you know, when I uh, stepped down as president, people said, Andrea, what were your greatest failures? And I thought, well, they were my greatest learning experiences. I mean, I remember when we first launched children's savings accounts and one of our partners in the South couldn't get anyone to come and sign up. 
because everybody believed it was too good to be true. And it wasn't until they got the leaders in the community who then said, no, this is a real thing. You need to trust us. And it wasn't a fancy program. It was the community engagement, which we all know is core to the success of anything we do. And that failure was the key moment to really change our methods about how we do almost anything. One more time, Abby, are you, can we hear you? All right, it's the firewalls. Um, and, uh, but I hope everybody can see Abby's comment, which is a key piece that she was gonna speak to about how this kind of capital really is a way to meet the moment and for us to really address the call for equity and a more equitable recovery. Um, and one of the things she's gonna say, and we're gonna open it up now to the broader audience is really, how do we think about pilots that can really test this? One of the things we tried to do when we were writing the blueprint was find data on how much enterprise capital was out there. There is no data source. Right. And we just met last week with the major source of philanthropic data, and they were absolutely intrigued of how would they do different searches to try to find out who was doing this kind of funding. But it really speaks to where we are in the system that there's not a category. And I used to always say this when I had to fill in my alumni career uh, for my undergraduate college that there was a, never a category for somebody who had uh, chosen a career in economic justice. You know, there were categories for everybody else. So I was always out of that category. And that is very much, I think, where we are today. So with that, Elena, um, can you open it up and bring in the um, other co-authors of the Blueprint? And Abby, if at any point you're able to speak, just yell. So I was um, uh, incredibly uh, gifted to have uh, in all these wonderful research assistants, all who've graduated and are still working on this. So um, I'd love them just to jump in to share some of their reflections and or their questions. Elizabeth, you want to go first? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Elizabeth. Elizabeth Davidson, a recent SOM graduate and currently working for an innovation and growth strategy consulting company. Um, one of my biggest reflections was applying the lessons I learned in business school to the nonprofit world. So often uh, we would reflect with Andrea on, you know, what, what are these elements that we can take from business school into more of a nonprofit finance world? Um, and I'd really love to hear a little bit more reflections around uh, what can business schools do to help further uh, this particular agenda and make nonprofit capital markets work better. Logan, you go first, because I know what Will will do. <laughs> so I, I think uh, in the nonprofit sector, we have amazing leaders who are visionaries. And I think one thing in a, that business school folks like yourself could help us with is strategizing, prioritizing, making sure that this great vision can actually come to fruition because there's, as Ashish, I believe mentioned, there's an infrastructure behind it. Um, but also like we're picking on the, the lowest hanging fruit first. Um, if you were to jump inside my brain right now, you go crazy because I have all of these ideas that I wanna make come to life. But it's like, all right, what's the thing that we can do the quickest and what has the greatest impact? So when we sit down and talk about what we want to do, thanks to my friend Michelle Matthews at Purpose Built Communities, we look at, you know, every year, the beginning of the year with our three organizations, what are our big rocks? You know, what are the things that we, that we need to get done? And then what are the pebbles, the stones, the sand, the water around it that we need to fill that jar in order to achieve those big rocks? And that's how we strategize the rest of our year in terms of activities that then turn into outputs, outcomes, and ultimately impact. Anybody else want to jump in to that fabulous question? 
I think business schools are really good at teaching mindsets and confidence to MBA students and, and graduate students. And I think um, their skills, particularly financial skills that um, are taught in business school and not in other graduate schools. So I think both the mindset of confidence and the financial skills are so relevant, as Logan said, to the nonprofit sector. The question is, how can those skills and mindsets be actually transferred? Is it as a consultant? Is it as a board member? Is it as an employee? And that, I think, comes down to the values of what the person really wants in life. Um, I will say that particularly in, in a global network like we have, we've used some great business school students to create uh, a framework of fixed, flexible freestyle where there's some things that are globally fixed, some things that are regionally flexible, and some things that are locally freestyle. And that type of a you know, nice, simple to understand framework actually has tremendously helped get adoption around the world for different initiatives. You know, I, I can't resist, uh, Andrea. That was such a softball question for me. Um, because uh, for, for so long, the Yale School of Management was one of the um, few um, management schools that that really held a high profile with respect to training people for for not for profit management but you know what as she says is exactly right which is um, only a small fraction of people that graduate from the school of management at Yale go into working full time at a not for profit but what happens is that the the uh, the mindset and interest and understanding of the not-for-profit sector kind of is fairly pervasive in our school and people go on to become board members. Um, they see opportunities to um, uh, have a part of their career in life connected to the not-for-profit sector. And, and so we've got an amazing alumni base of people, um, many of which, most of which actually, have, have uh, had careers in, in, in the for-profit sector. I will say that one of the things that I think is important um, in business school education is the ability to um, look for, look at any uh, organization or problem from many different perspectives. And so um, uh, to take an example from a not-for-profit organization, uh, mission organization, um, you know, you may look at a situation, Andrea, like you were uh, looking at, which is Boy, people are not signing up for this uh, for this savings account. What the heck's the matter? At a business school, at a management school, because you take courses in many different ways of looking at a problem, it could range from maybe you have an IT problem uh, and you would solve it that way to maybe you have a financial problem. Maybe you haven't really set up the incentives correctly. Um, you know, you have an organizational behavior problem. Maybe this notion that people have more fear than they have uh, enthusiasm. And uh, it could be an accounting problem. But having the ability to quickly shift from one perspective to the other and say, well, that's not a finance problem. That's an organizational behavior problem. That's a skill that we would really that's a skill that's needed more of. Um, and I think some management schools have taken that um, that tack. And as I always said, an MBA is a generalist degree, right? You, you take classes in at least nine different disciplines. Um, and the most you take in any one is two or three to be able to take full advantage. Um, I want to move next to Alexandria, Alexandra and then Vicky, but I do want to answer quickly two great questions on the side. One is, should we think about collaborative funds to fund enterprise capital? The answer is a huge yes, because one of the issues is, how do we jointly agree to standards, but allow different funders to use their own funnels to be able to give the capital, but share key concepts? Um, so that's one. The second is the question of financial sustainability. Um, I think this is a huge issue and my passion. I've just finished doing financial analyses of 10 organizations who are in the latest cohort of building high impact nonprofits of color. Each of them has had a profound change in their financial situation because of the events all to the positive of the last year, year and a half. But because they've been in a complete world of scarcity, which is often the world in which nonprofits live, they're very, very risk averse, back to our point about what to do. 
We need the ability to create highly accessible financial models where you can test different ideas so people can see what's the real world impact if, as Logan says, I give everybody Monday off. And what does that mean for my financials? And I can talk about that more later. Let me hand it over to Alexandra. Thanks, Andrea. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. So yes, I'm Alexandra. I work for an organization called Open Road Alliance. We make emergency grants to nonprofits and bridge loans to social enterprises. A few of the concepts that I've been reflecting on from this discussion are one, risk aversion in philanthropy, and then two, this idea of marrying strategy and structure. Ashish, on the structure side, you mentioned networks. I'm also thinking about capital structure. And so I'm wondering if there are any reflections on this idea of launching a dedicated enterprise capital fund to invest in nonprofit organizations. Do you think that that would be an effective way to demonstrate the viability of the enterprise capital model? And do you think it would help influence other funders to adopt similar practices? It's a great question, Alexandra. And I think um, it ties to what Elizabeth said, which is if you think of what MBA schools create in terms of skills is the skills that would allow you to launch such a fund, right? So you've got the ability to create the framework, you've got the finance skills, you've got the general management skills. The question is, will the will there be enough supply of capital demand for your services on both sides of the marketplace, the funder side and the recipient side? I think the recipient side, you know, everyone's hungry for enterprise capital, so you'll be able to pick and choose who you want to fund. On the funder side, I really think um, it, the types of funders who are ready to effectively cede decision rights to somebody else to fund their unrestricted funds is very, very small. And it will be completely how you frame it. It's exactly how venture capital, you know, I've been funded by venture capital in my previous roles. It's exactly how venture capitalists take the approach to raising money from limited partners. If you go to a limited partner and say, I know more than you about this asset class, please cede decision rights to me. They're probably gonna go, ah, oh, you don't know more than me. But if you go to them and say, I've got three years of experience creating great returns for other limited partners just like you in this enterprise class. Therefore, please trust me with your money. That's a totally different pitch. So I think if you've got the kind of track record to show enterprise capital has led to impact that allows them to share the credit, shall we say, the impact ROI for a better, you know, better way to say credit, impact ROI. Um, I do think there's real potential there. The number of funders I would think which are ready for that is not massive, but large enough to create a fund or two. Great. I'm gonna, oh, Logan, you wanna jump in? Cause I want to get to Vicki and then I wanna get one of the case study, other case study leaders on the board. Go ahead, Logan. Thank you. So it's interesting because the way I'm hearing the enterprise capital, it's about the investment into the nonprofit. And I think as, investors look at investing in nonprofits, they need to look at the nonprofit and how it's investing into the community and clients that they're serving. So I think about what we did in the past year with the Riverside Relief Fund, where we set up basically a, a fund to help get the most impoverished community through the pandemic. And we were doing direct cash investments into the community. We raised $500,000 in a matter of months and distribute 285,000 direct cash to families. Each family got $1,250. On top of that, Chromebooks, food. We signed up uh, folks for the census and moved our census count rate from less than 60% to over 84%, which will be a $6 million return of federal funding to the state of Delaware. Now we're working and using that as a springboard for a new initiative we're launching this year called Empower, which stands for economic mobility places ownership within everyone's reach. And Andrew, you'll love, we're working with Lillian on building out this framework and logic model for it. We're investing a million dollars every year into this initiative so we can have this desired mixed income community and move everyone in our community up the economic ladder to self-sufficiency. Each year, our community costs the state of Delaware $15 million if you just look at three welfare programs, SNAP, Medicaid and child care. Us investing $3 million over the next three years will be a $12 million return. So when we think about enterprise capital to nonprofits, look at how those nonprofits are then reinvesting that money back into the community. That's the ultimate return on the investment because now you have a community that's supporting the economy and not draining the economy. And that's the true win-win. 
Absolutely brilliant, Logan. It's like, how do we deal with the upstream social determinants of health? Uh, as my friend David Erickson at the New York Fed always says, the way we're funding this is stupid and expensive, and we need to change it. Um, so I want to invite Paul Bradley to join us on the screen, but Vicki, uh, introduce yourself and shoot away. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Vicki Zhang, and I currently work in data and analytics for a financial services firm. So I think you guys can probably get a sense just from my job title where my line of questioning is going to be going. But as Andrea mentioned, we've tried to sort of get more data to support the business case for enterprise capital, and it's been difficult. So I wanted to get your perspectives on how getting valuable data, consistent data in this nonprofit space would benefit each of you and how we should go about building that together. Thank you. Well, really quickly, we have been uh, the benefit, have the benefit of working with Prosperity Now for almost three years now. And the intentionality about the Building High Impact Nonprofits of Color initiative, where they invested in us to help us build capacity, they're a big part of our success because that additional capacity allows us to bring on folks that are now being able to track those metrics and bring about that data. We're so busy serving our clients, we don't always necessarily have the capacity to track what we're doing. I mean, our clients are literally in survival mode, but we're very fortunate with the shared services agreement, with the amazing partnerships we have with, you know, Prosperity Now, Purposeful Communities. We have Delaware State University, who is our, our research partner, that we're able now to be in that fortunate position to, to track these metrics. But everyone doesn't have that, that luxury. Um, so we really have to figure out how do we invest in those nonprofits that are doing great work, but just might not have to have, not have the capacity to track those metrics. Well, Vicki, uh, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Um, so I was going to say that analytics is core to our strategy currently. And the question you've asked is so timely and relevant for what we're living through right now. So we're collecting data from 115 countries using a common platform we've just invested in. It was very, very challenging to raise capital to build this common platform. So what we ended up doing is partnering with Microsoft and Avanade. Avanade is a joint venture between Accenture and Microsoft to actually build a platform to collect this data from all the countries. And I will say that I think is, is um, kind of reason why I've been harping on alliances, coalitions, and networks which allow aggregation of data in a way that you don't have to go and pay a consulting firm to do it. It's sort of part of why you're part of the organization. But if there's a way to take our example of collecting information and make it relevant for the attempts to build enterprise capital, not only for our network, but for others, I think that's where the real magic can happen, right? Is you can actually leverage how data is collected across different networks. And Microsoft's doing a lot of work in that area. I'd sort of encourage you to check out what they're doing their Tech for Good initiative? Uh, my response, um, let me present a kind of a contrary response. Um, uh, and that is that, you know, when we had our financial crisis in 2008, um, there, were, uh, there were proposals to try and make transparent the balance sheets of all of the banks. But we knew what would happen if that was the case is that the banks that were on the slightly weaker side would suffer runs uh, and people would withdraw their money. And uh, so um, that would create a, a deeper uh, financial problem. So, you know, um, when I think about the data problem, I think that, as she says, keeping it within a network keeping the information about what is successful, what is robust financially versus not robust financially, keeping it within a network that you can control the access to that information could prevent a kind of a run on these organizations um, might be caused by sort of fear about, about, about their uh, long-term viability. So I think Public, I understand, Vicki, that it's going to be hard to get public information, but I think that's actually appropriate. I think keeping it within the context of the institutions that understand 
uh, the, the 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 logic and the finances and the risk and the return trade-offs for the for the for the not-for-profits may be the right locus for this data collection. Great, thank you so much. Um, we are at our time, but I do want to uh, recognize a couple of uh, critical questions and points. Um, one is we had a question about what are the right structures for nonprofits to think about their work differently and to be able to attract different types of capital? Um, and uh, I'm going to speak for Paul Bradley, who's the founder and chair of Rock USA, which of course I chair, so public admission. Um, but essentially, we set that up as a nonprofit LLC with some excellent guidance from one of our bankers because. He said, make sure you have the ability to bring in for-profit investors when the organization reaches the stage where they can pay for that kind of capital to be able to scale. So I do think there are some other structures that we can be thinking about that can facilitate this. Um, and there's work on this as well. Um, the other really interesting question, just to throw out to everybody here, is what is the one barrier that if we could surmount it would help to really scale this enterprise capital? And maybe I'll ask people to close out with that, which is um, how do we pick our number one thing to do? It could be the number one barrier or the number one opportunity. And Will is heading off to get his COVID vaccine, so we should all... So I'll let him go first. <laughs> well, you may be asking the person that uh, is least uh, qualified to answer the question because I I, I don't serve as as an executive uh, in this field, and that's that's really an executive decision. I when I, mean, I listened to Logan's answer recently about uh, how you deal with the fact that you've got a million things to do. Uh, how do you get to ranking them? Um, I think that process of prioritization is what you're you're interested in and for me um, you know my priority has been research and teaching uh, so I may not be the best to to, to, to point us all in one um, big direction I if I send us marching along to create fintech solutions uh, that might not be the the way everybody would uh, would think is is the most effective but I think um, you know we do have these crises right now um, that are uh, crises of inequality and crises of rach racial injustice. And then to top it off, of course, uh, unemployment and, and, and health and COVID. And so I'm inclined right now to think about uh, prioritizing immediate relief, uh, all hands on deck, um, thinking about addressing what we need to do in the next six months. Most of what we talked about are, kind of are big conceptual issues, but um, you know, I, I, I think um, you know, what can I do in the next month or two to make sure that uh, the Connecticut food banks are actually functioning? Those are the kinds of issues that I think are before us. Thanks, Will. Logan? So uh, a plan that sits on the shelf is just a dream. And too often we look at models and we look at plans and we say, this is what's going to get the work done. But people are what drive initiatives. And I often say when I get public speaking opportunities, like I'm not supposed to be here. I grew up in a single mother household in a low income neighborhood, but I had people that instilled in me faith, love, and provided me with some social capital. And we really have to think about, are we investing in our leaders, our current leaders and our future leaders, because le leaders and leadership is what get things done. So let's think about how we invest in our people, because people have to execute the plan. And no matter how good a plan is, it does nothing if it doesn't get executed. Beautifully said. Ashish, take it home. Well, building on what both Will and Logan said, the need for immediate solutions and the need for 
um, really trusting in people to get these things done. And I, we've got Elizabeth, Alexandra, and Vicky, who all are, you know, frankly eager to launch the idea they have in front of them. And in the case of Vicky, I think it, it sounds like you've already launched. And what I would really encourage you to do is to think of a catalyst to actually help you succeed. So, for example, uh, in the B Corp movement, there was a catalyst, which is a new legal structure which attracted capital to make B Corps happen. In the person to person loan movement, which I was part of in the early days, we convinced the credit bureaus, you know, thanks to Prosperity Now and CFED and others at the time, to, um, to, to accept data on person to person loans. That created an asset class. In the enterprise capital space, I'd look for a catalytic moment that allows you to attract capital. I don't think you'll have any problem on the recipient side. So that's what I would encourage you to think about as the next big thing. Fabulous, fabulous. So um, I'm just gonna share a, a couple of things. Abby wants us to know that it's enterprise capital and to make, the biggest challenge is to make it stick and to figure out how we create a new asset class going forward. And all I want to say is all of you who've been part of this conversation, with over 100 people, sharing your ideas and how we do this um, on the websites, my email address to me is exactly how we need to do this. And bringing along both the tools, how do we help nonprofits model themselves so they really could understand financial implications of their decisions? How do we create an AmeriCorps program of MBA students or people who can do really good Excel spreadsheets, which I really can't compare anymore, um, that help organizations with this capacity? We heard from some of our participants that it really is the lack of financial backbone of many nonprofits that is the biggest barrier to doing this. So how do we solve that problem? And with that, I just want to thank I want to thank everybody here, the panel, everybody who tried to get on. We're just going to have a whole nother session so you can hear all of Abby's brilliance. Um, some of us are going to be able to stay on for the chat. So anybody who wants to stay with us for the chat. And let me also say we saw this in the um, chat that Pia Infante, who's gonna be speaking later at lunch, has been a leader in trust-based philanthropy. And she and I had several conversations before this because so many of the principles of enterprise capital are part of trust-based philanthropy. But what our conversation does is add the finance to that. How does making financial choices and decisions add to having trust in how you do philanthropy? So with that, can we have the link again in the chat um, at the bottom? So those of us who can uh, continue on uh, have that link. And uh, again, I just wanna thank everybody uh, for being such an incredible, incredible panel. Andrea, for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. All right, uh, we'll see